computing technology has gone through many different changes in its lifetime. Computers started off as being the size of a room, and nowadays our smartphones hold more processing power than what put man on the moon, a hundred thousand times more powerful. And in that time, the way that we interact with our devices has changed. From the base entering of command code with a keyboard, to the graphical user interface with a mouse, to the clicky buttons, trackpads, and scroll wheels, and finally, onto touch, voice, air commands, and eye control of today. But still, all of those are input for output. What if computing was no input for many outputs? That is what a lot of companies are working on today, and also what forms the basis for Google's ecosystem. Let's get into it. So, this is actually going to be the first in a series of videos examining Google's ecosystem. And to start all of it off, we need to figure out what an ecosystem actually is, especially from a marketing perspective. A product ecosystem is a series of interconnected products, whether software or hardware, that complement each other and provide greater value to the customer. Creating an ecosystem of products is beneficial for companies and the consumer for numerous reasons. First, it creates a level of quality that the consumer can expect out of your product. Second, it generates expectations about how other products in that ecosystem will work. And lastly, those products can integrate better together than any other device from other brands ever could. As cliche as it is, take Apple. All of their products work and blend really well together, but they also set expectations for how the other one will work before you even use that other device. Moving between an iPhone and an iPad, even with the differences between the two, is incredibly easy as the iPad is operated in almost the exact same way as the iPhone is. So someone new who hasn't gotten an iPhone and then wants a tablet would feel very comfortable getting an iPad. They have an expectation for how the iPad will work based off their iPhone, and Apple rewards them by meeting that expectation. That is a huge benefit to the consumer as most consumers don't like big changes or drastic differences in the products that they use. And Apple meeting that consumer's expectations can expect more loyalty as familiarity with a product and liking a product are very easily confusable on the consumer's end. So in summary, having an ecosystem of products is beneficial as it generates expectations, sets a level of quality, and allow us for deeper integration between products. But with all of that said, why does Google now want this ecosystem and why are they now expanding it so much? First is the obvious answer. It'll make them some money. For years, Google was content to let other manufacturers take the lead on hardware. The Nexus phone program was never about becoming a dominant smartphone manufacturer but instead showing what Android could and should be. After all, everyone knows Google makes their money off of advertising. A lot of money off of advertising. But 2016 changed that with the introduction of the first Google Pixel phone. And over time came the integration of Nest products as well as other smart home devices. Interviews with the Pixel team made it clear that they wanted to sell devices in large volumes, even if at that time, the Android division and Pixel division inside Google were kept separate. However, as time has gone on, Google has introduced more Pixel branded devices with phones, headphones, and now the upcoming Pixel Buds Pro, Pixel Watch, and Pixel Slate. Whatever the hell this thing is. Even with all of this, Google may still not make a lot of money off of hardware, but they would still rather you spend money and buy a Pixel phone rather than getting an iPhone, as your money is now going into Google's pocket rather than Apple's pocket. And the hardware side of building an ecosystem 
is incredibly important, which we'll get to in a minute. But overall, Google's goal here isn't to make all of their money off of Pixel hardware sales. And for that main goal, I turn to a buzzword that you've probably heard at some point. Get your groans out now. Ambient computing. Ambient computing is this idea that instead of you tapping on your phone, swiping on a trackpad, putting in something in a keyboard, asking a voice command, your tech just does its thing. Instead of you asking your smart speaker in the morning what the forecast for the day will look like, it's your smart speaker automatically telling you when your alarm goes off, and then your phone sending you a reminder to get an umbrella or bring a rain jacket if you need based on the forecast when you're about to leave. But your phone knows when you're leaving because it knows your calendar. You don't have to do anything. Another example is walking into your house and only the lights of the room that you're in turning on because your smart home knows where you are and what other devices are around you and are needed at that moment. The goal is integrating all of these different devices and sensors together, not to make your technology stand out, but to make it blend into the background and just be helpful for you when you need it. So that's great and all, it's very convenient and helpful, but there's a problem. What happens when you leave this smart integrated house and you're just walking around on the street? Where are the smarts there? That is where hardware comes in, and that is where we can start seeing Google's roadmap for how they want to achieve this. Back at Google 2019, Rick Osterloh said, the devices aren't the center of the system. You are. That's our vision for ambient computing. There was a lot of discussion of how moving forward, Google wanted to be more helpful, which was why Google was developing this new range of hardware. Because while software is incredibly important, at a certain point, hardware becomes integral for this vision's success. Imagine this. You're out walking down the street, and it's coming up to be lunchtime. Your headphones know that you typically order DoorDash at a certain point, so it looks around and finds a good Chinese place for you, and it tells you about this Chinese place and asks if you want to make an order, and if you do, it takes your order, and then it calls the restaurant for you, places that order for takeout, based on the time that it'll take you to walk to that restaurant. Because your headphones are communicating to your Pixel Watch, which measures your gait and knows approximately how long it takes you to walk from one spot to the other. And all of that information it can share with any other device that needs it. All that you've had to do is tell your headphones that you wanted the order and then told it what you wanted. While that's not the true full ambient computing of never having to tell a computer anything, it's about as close as Google wants to get. Now, on the surface, this all seems antithetical to Google's business model. Is how is it getting information? Where is it advertising to you? When you look a little deeper, it starts making sense. For all of this to work, Google has to collect a lot of data about you. And all of that data is leverageable in some way, shape, or form. While the idea is to make everything a computer that you don't have to interact with, that's not really where Google is headed. Even if Google is able to achieve everything they want, which is an incredibly difficult task to do, by the way, there will still be points that you interact with technology, and all of those points are places that Google can show you at, the bread and butter of their business. Eventually, you'll tap on your Pixel phone to do something. You'll still watch YouTube on a Pixel tablet. You'll still see the sponsored emails in Gmail on your Galaxy phone. 
All of those are interactable points that can be used to serve up ads. It's not just making you buy a Pixel phone or Pixel watch or Pixel earphones, although that'll definitely be the easiest and best way to get access to all of these different services. It means making it so that any device can sign into a Google account. And once it's signed into a Google account, that it can serve all of the information that you might need at any given point. Like an iCloud account over on the Apple side, once any device can access a Google account, that device will suddenly become much smarter about you and you specifically. It's why the Google app for iOS exists. It's why Google is working so hard to keep all of their different hardware and software partners happy yet continuously tied to Google. Google isn't making so much of a walled garden with their ecosystem as they're making an open world with it, where any device can in just a few seconds know everything it could need to know about you. That is why Google is trying to expand their ecosystem so much. Thank you all so much for watching this video. Make sure you get subscribed to see the next part of this series, which will be coming out pretty soon. For now, I'm Michael with TechMB, and I'll see you in the next one.